Greetings. Um, here we are. Um, another week has gone by, and I'm so glad to be here being able to bring you a message from God's Word. I hope you've had a blessed week, and I hope that uh, um, in your life you've seen uh, um, the, the compassion and grace and mercy of, of God in your life and Christ His Son. So I just want to begin by asking you this question. Who are you? And while you ponder that question, ask yourself this question, who am I? So who are you and who am I? Two questions that address uh, personal identity. Well, along with personal identities, social studies reveal that all of us have a social identity as well. And social identity is about how you see yourself, as someone said, quote, as alike with the people you identify with. For example, maybe your political persuasion, conservative, liberal, whatever, your cultural background, your ethnicity, your religious uh, identification, Christian, Muslim, etc. One of the things that's been happening in the past few years is a growing and and growing concern with personal identity, or as one a writer put it, quote, unprecedented interest in the subject of personal identity. Just take a look at all the self book, self-help books. They abound with ways and steps you can, you can, you can for example, to quote the title of a few of them, become your best self, or one that's been pretty popular for a while, your best life now. Now, Brian Rosner, one of his uh, articles, highlights the catchy quotes that express the effort in our day for individualism, for personal identity. And really, these are found in our everyday experiences. A local gym that uses the advertising slogan, Be fit, be well, be you. Or one school that advertises the slogan going something like this, be inspired, be challenged, be excellent, be you. And certainly the internet has exploded with five and five, ten second uh, video reels on social media with encouragement to be your own hero, stand up for your identity, you are your own style, your identity is your spark, and one more, embrace your authenticity. And Rosner, in his short expose, has a balanced approach to this intensifying focus on personal identity in our culture. For he rightly sees that self-reflection and personal exploration do have some value to them. For example, the Bible exhorts the believer to examine themselves, to test themselves in respect to their lives and their faith in God. And so when it comes to social identity, a healthy self-reflection can lead to positive changes in society and, and in one's person. On the negative side, this intensified focus on self-identity has created fragile individuals. Because along with finding yourself comes the reality and the possibility of failing. And in the journey of self-discovery, asking who am I, there is a distinct possibility you're not going to like what you find. And I think we just have to take a moment to consider our times around us and what's going on in our culture, and you will find a marked increase in mental health issues. Um, anxiety, depressions abound. We have this real lack of compassion in the culture, this rage that is, is just growing in the culture, and this explosion in narcissism. So the question is, what is one to do? Well, if you ask the culture, it provides plenty of reasons for this increased individual and social failures, along with plenty of solutions that often uh, just hinder valuable change. You know, Rosner is right. The intense focus on self is limiting. My friends, the long and the short of it, is that we need to understand that our identities are much more than personal or individual. 
Our lives, as Rosner puts it in his article, are shared stories, of course, families and nations and social classes, our faith. But he really points out to a really important, uh, important uh, issue. The truth we all face every day, whether we agree or not, whether we understand it or not, whether we see it or not, is this, quote, we will serve the true and living God or dumb idols, gods that fail. Long time ago, singer-songwriter Bob Dylan put it this way, you're going to have to serve somebody, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, friends, please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to pick off, pick up where, pick off, pardon me, pick up where we left off last week in Galatians chapter 4. At, and we're going to start in verse 21 and read through to the end of the chapter. Verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had, Abraham had two sons one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Verse 28. Now you, brothers like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit the son of the free woman. Verse 31, So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the, three, of the free woman. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. As we now spend some time looking at this a little closer, we ask by your spirit that you would help us to understand it. And not only help us to understand it, but to put it into our lives and into our action in our everyday life as well. Help us to do that, Lord. And then when we do these things, we pray that you would be honored and glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we just uh, start where we left off last time. Uh, the Apostle Paul continuing to bring the Galatian believers back to the truth of their identity, since we're on that subject. And he said here in chapter 4, verse 7, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. But despite this reality, it was by reasoning with a biblical orientation that the Judaizers had been able to make some inroads with the Galatian believers. For example, in chapter 4, verse 10, it reveals that some had decided, it seems, at the very least, to follow the Mosaic calendar. You know, the weekly Sabbaths, the new moon festivals, and the annual Jewish festivals such as Passover and Pentecost. And along with the Mosaic calendar was the teaching of the Judaizers that the male Gentile believer would also be circumcised according to the Mosaic law. And I think one can come to the reasonable conclusion that some would have taken this upon themselves because it looks like Paul came to that conclusion when he said in Galatians 5, 2, I say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Why? Well, Galatians 5, 3, every man who accepts circumcision is obligated to keep the whole law. Also, it seems the Judaizers and their teaching would have highlighted Abraham and the covenant God had made with him. Abraham, to the devout Jew, as we see in the Bible, was highly regarded and called their father. And it is reasonable to consider that the Genesis account of Abraham and Sarah would be a primary source of biblical support for the Judaizers in their attempt to persuade the Galatians 
to adopt the, lie, uh, adopt the law in order to live a godly life before God. And of course, one of the primary pieces that I've already alluded to in living this godly life on, uh, that Judaizers would teach would be the requirement of circumcision for the male Galatians believer. Therefore, as we look at this text, Paul goes to the very same source as the Judaizers to correct an incorrect interpretation and application of the Abrahamic covenant. So as we turn now our full attention to verse 21 to 31, we have before us a difficult task because this in itself is a difficult piece of scripture. How are we to understand and interpret these 10 verses? And how are we to apply the text? And what are the implications for you and me today in the 21st century? I think what we need to do, no, what we're going to do, is we're going to be framing verse 21 to 31 with what we know from the context. We don't want to go beyond the bounds of the context, at least at this particular place, we would, because we would be swimming in uncharted waters with the potential to get it all wrong and go under water. So we begin by understanding that the Galatians were Gentiles who were not under the law, yet it seems here some were adopting the law. Hence this question that Paul asks them in verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Well, we, we, we turn to what Paul said to the Roman church for some commentary concerning this issue. Paul said to the Roman church, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. That's Romans chapter 2, verse 12. See, here's what's happening. The Galatians, in essence, would be trading one slave master for another. Point number two, secondly, the Gentiles in Galatia at one time were, according to chapter 4, verse 3, enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. They were slaves to the pagan gods and the whims and the fancies of their pagan culture. They were at one time, as Paul said to the Ephesians in that letter, separated from Christ, having no hope and without God. The Galatians at one time, Paul would say, were darkness. But that's what he says to the Ephesian church, Ephesians 5, 8. And now we're not talking they were walking in darkness. They were darkness. They were darkness, contrary to the things of God. Thirdly, while they were at one time darkness, Paul said here in chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, God sent forth his son to do what? To redeem. Paul had preached the crucified Christ to the Galatians, and they believed this gospel, and they were redeemed. Fourthly, the Galatians were adopted, chapter 4, verse 5. And as evidence of this adoption, God sent his spirit sent the spirit of his son into their hearts. Chapter 4, verse 6. They had, as he, Paul said in chapter 3, verse 27, put on Christ. Well, with all this, we, now we come to the harder matter, heart of the matter, which is the last piece. The Galatians had come to know God. 4, 9. But better yet, they were also known by God. So there we have, we have this framing that we need to help us and guide us to understand and apply verse 21 and 31. I wanted to talk to you now about uh, allegory and typology and all that sort of stuff, but I would ask you to go to a dictionary, go to dictionary.com and, and look up the meaning of allegory and typology because we have this working hand in hand here and 21 to 31. So moving on as we look closer at our text, we see that Paul turns to the book of Genesis and the story of Abraham and Sarah, which starts in Genesis chapter 12 and concludes in chapter 25 of Genesis. And Abraham is covenant, as we know, 
with God had a giant role in the nation of Israel, and it has a role in its place with the gospel of Christ and the new covenant and the believers today. Paul turned to the story of Abraham, and he said here in verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. God had covenanted with Abraham and promised him that he would have his very own son and that it would be Abraham's heir. Who would be Abraham's heir? We see that in Genesis 15, 4. And it was through his son Isaac that Abraham would be a blessing to many nations and so much more. Then we flip the page to Genesis chapter 16, where we find Sarah and her Egyptian slave, Hagar. And we know that Sarah was barren, unable to have children, so she convinced Abraham here in chapter 16 to have a child with her servant, Hagar. And this is what Paul is referring to here as a son by a slave woman in verse 22, a son born according to the flesh, verse 23 here in Galatians chapter 4. We go back to Genesis, we flip the page over from 16 to chapter 17 of Genesis, and there we find God saying to Abraham this about Sarah, I will bless her and give you a son by her, and she, that is Sarah, shall become nations, kings of people shall come from her, Genesis 17, 15 and 16. And we know that, that Abraham said, well, look at I'm 100 and she's whatever. But you know what, what God said? God said, yes, Abraham, even though you are 100 years old and your wife is 90 years old, you will have a son, I promise. And this is what Paul is referring to as a son by a free woman here in verse 22 in our text and a son born through promise, verse 23. Well, here we are now moving into verse 24 to 26. Take a look at that. And Paul tells us that he's now going to take the biblical events he addressed in this text and interpret them allegorically. Again, I would suggest you look that up on dictionary.com or in your, in your dictionary. And this is what makes the text difficult to interpret. But it is the way and the means by which Paul is going to correct the twisting by the false teachers of the Genesis account of Abraham and Sarah. And thankfully, as you have walked through with me with the five or six points that we've taken the time to frame these verses in the context of Paul's letter will help us not go underwater. So taking verse 23 and 24 together, we can organize Paul's statements here by a closer look at each character in the event or in the story. So let's begin with Hagar. Hagar was a slave woman. And children born of a slave woman would also be slaves. Sarah was a free woman, and a children born to a free woman would be free. And as we move into the territory of allegory, Hagar is a representative then of, or a type of, the Mosaic covenant from Mount Sinai. And her son Ishmael, who was born of a slave woman by the flesh, is a representative, a type of the law. We turn to Sarah, and Sarah is a representative of the Abrahamic covenant. And her son Isaac, who was born of a free woman by supernatural means, is a representative of grace. So we keep this in mind now as we move now to verse 25 and 26. Together, we'll take that together. Staying with the allegorical interpretation, Hagar and Sarah are representative types of two different Jerusalems. Verse 25 tells us that Hagar stands for Mount Sinai, and she is a representative of the first century Jerusalem. And the people of the first century Jerusalem were slaves to the law. Turning to Sarah, she is a representative of what Paul called the Jerusalem above, which is free. Verse 26 Let's go to uh, chapter 12 of Hebrews to get some commentary. And there we find the writer of Hebrews speaking of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And he said, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly assembly. You find that in Hebrews 12, 22. 
We go to Revelation 21 and it speaks of this city that Hebrews talks about when John writes, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Revelation 21, 2. So Sarah is a representative of the heavenly city of God where all believers will end up one day. Well, that's kind of a bunch of stuff there, isn't it? I hope, I hope you've been able to follow along. Because now I want you to notice what Paul said about the Jerusalem above, which is free. She is also our mother, verse 27. And then he quotes Isaiah 54.1 at verse 28. So what's this all about? What's going on here? Well, let's keep it simple, sweetie. Paul is using this Old Testament reference as a contrast. As a contrast. And the contrast is, as the Holman New Testament, New Testament commentary puts it, between the future family lines of these two women. Sarah, remember, she represents the grace of God, was barren. But because of God's promise, ends up with countless spiritual children. By the way, if you're a believer... If you're a follower of Christ, you are one of her children. You see, Sarah surpasses Hagar's family line, which was under the law. Hopefully you're still tracking with me. So here it is in a nutshell. Let's, let's do it this way. Take all of Paul's allegorical statements and interpretation and put this into one sentence. And we can say it this way. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. All that to say that. But I think it was important that we dug through that. And, because this can be a difficult piece of scripture to try and wrap your head around it and understand it. Now we want to move into verse 28. And what we see here, Paul in a different way is just saying the same thing as he said in Ephesians 2, 8. What I just, uh, we just read together. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. And then you're probably going, how is this the same as Ephesians 2, 8? Well, let me help you by uh, looking at two different scriptures. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. And let's read what Paul said there. Paul said, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, that's the plural, Referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Keep that phrase in your mind, who is Christ. Friends, the promise of God did not come to Abraham by the law, but as Paul said in Romans 4.13, but through righteousness that comes by faith. Now do you see that he's saying the same thing here in verse 28 as he's saying in Ephesians 2.8. Now Paul turns... Uh, in a different direction here, in 29.30, he turns his attention directly toward the Judaizers. I call this, a, he gave them a quick uppercut to the jaw. This is like a quick uppercut. Snuck right in there between the, between the block and hit him in the jaw. Take a look at this. Verse 29 points us to Genesis 29, uh, pardon me, 21.9, where Hagar's son, Hagar's son, Ishmael, who was born of flesh, mocks. Isaac, during a feast Abraham gave for his son Isaac. Paul, putting it this way, in verse 29, persecuted him, that's Isaac, who was born according to flesh. So also it is now. In other words, this is what's happening to you folks, you Galatians, in Galatia, by these Judaizers. They're mocking, they're mocking what you have received by promise through the Spirit. Then Paul quotes here in verse 30, Genesis 21.10. So what does this mean? Well, Paul is saying this to the Galatians. You have, have nothing to do with those Judaizers. They are born of the flesh. You Galatians, all believers today, are children of promise, not of the law. And Paul has already told us in Galatians 2.20, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, 
but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Galatians 2, verse 20. Go back to the question that I asked at the beginning. Who are you? Really, who are you? Have you asked yourself, who am I? Sure, you're an individual. You, you have a personal identity. You have a social identity, family, etc., and all that stuff. Let me come at this from another angle. How would you define yourself? Or better yet, what defines you? Your job, your family, your culture, your ethnicity, your gender, your wealth, your age. What defines you? Well, since we're on a roll, let me ask you another question. Do you know God? And does God know you? I might as well throw another question out to you. Where do you belong? And I don't want you to count your house address. Or how about this? Whose do you belong to? Remember Bob Dylan who said, we all got to serve somebody. So then let me ask, who do you serve? Now as you ponder these questions, and they came at you at machine gun style, I know that, but ponder them, think them through, read your Bibles, pray. Rosner said this concerning the story of God's people in contrast to our culture's expressive individualism. He said this, quote, it asserts that you don't have it within you to define yourself. You need an intervention from outside the world. Outside of yourself. Pardon me, outside of yourself. My friends, if you are a biblical Christian, if you have been saved by grace through faith alone, and you follow Christ, you have died to self. As Paul said here in Galatians, it is no longer I who live. Galatians 2.20 and who are you? Your identity, my friends, is hidden with Christ in God, Colossians 3.3. You have been born of the Spirit, chapter 4, verse 6 of Galatians. You are to put to death what is earthly in you, Colossians 3.5. You are to put on many things, but absolutely love, Colossians 3.14. You are sons and daughters of God the Father, and no longer slaves, but heirs with all the privileges and inheritance that comes with this. And one day, my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, one day in God's time, the promise is this for you. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 4. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you. We thank you that we have our identity in you, O Lord Christ Jesus. In a world that is running amok with an identity crisis in so many ways. When a lot of challenges are coming our way from the culture as followers of Christ, I pray, Lord, that we would just turn to you and realize that as sons and daughters of your heavenly kingdom we have everything that we need for this life and the next because we have that through Christ alone we thank you for this Lord and I just pray for those who are hearing this or watching this or both pray God that you would bless them Surround them with your angels, protect them. And pray, Lord, that whatever they're going through, they would know the Lord as sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. You love them. You love them so very much. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much for having me in your places. God bless. Shalom.